Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Method Ministries. I am your host, Lucas Curcio. So the previous episode, we did a talk on why you should become a Wesleyan and not a Calvinist. And that got me thinking that I would really like to start talking more about Wesleyan doctrines. After all, Method Ministries finds its inspiration from the life and theology of John Wesley. So I am a Methodist, and I like talking about core doctrines and beliefs, and one of them is predestination. Or that is a a hot topic to say the least. I'm interested in it. I know a lot of people are interested in it, and I like talking about it. And recently, I have uh, seen some new things in the scriptures. So um, I'm, I, I, you know, like the rest of you, I'm trying to grow, learn in my understanding of the scriptures. And recently, I've seen some really cool things that I learned coming out of the text and what the Bible teaches on predestination. So I want to use this time to talk about that and hopefully benefit you. I know a lot of people think that Wesleyans or Wesley Arminians, because that's really what I'm what I'm trying to get out here, Wesley Arminians. So even if you're not a Wesleyan, you're an Arminian, and we are agreeing on soteriology in the sense that God is saving people, electing people, predestinating people conditionally by faith in Christ Jesus, which I'll get into really quick. But a lot of people think that Wesley Arminians, they don't have a doctrine of predestination that this debate comes down to predestination versus free will and that's totally completely wrong it's not true at all wesley arminians believe firmly and just as much in predestination in election why because these are biblical doctrines so you don't have to be a calvinist to affirm that god does elect people he has his elect god does predestine these elect people he does have a plan. He does have a purpose. God does ordain things. Actually, he did ordain things from the foundation of the world. These are just biblical doctrines. They don't, they don't belong to Calvinists. Calvinists don't have a monopoly on this. And Calvinists are a minority group in the Protestant Christian tradition. And the majority of Christians are not Calvinists. Yet, they still hold to predestination. They still hold to election. Now, of course, you're always going to have those rogue ones who may seem like they don't, but Wesley Arminian theology, as it exists uh, objectively, it's its own theology in its own right, and it's not even to be understood as something that's not Calvinist or against Calvinism. Again, it's a theology that exists objectively, independently from Calvinism, and therefore we have our own set of theological beliefs, and especially uh, theological beliefs that are distinct and separate and independent when it comes to soteriology. So today we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about election. We're going to talk about predestination from a the Wesleyan Arminian point of view. So today as we do this, I, um, I hope you have your Bibles opened. I will be reading the scriptures, but this will be even better for you. You'll be more benefited if you are following along in the scriptures uh, yourself with me as we go over this. But real quick, I do just want to talk about how I am approaching this from a Wesleyan point of view. Again, because I'm a Wesleyan, I'm a Wesley Arminian. I don't represent all of Wesleyans or Wesley's th- true theological belief regarding this, but I am a Wesley Arminian, so I will be using motifs, learnings, uh, insights from John Wesley to, to help understand this. But ultimately, the, the scriptures are authority, and that's what we're really trying to get to. We're all trying to get to what does the Bible say on this? So that being the case, when you look in the Wesleyan tradition, when you look in the Arminian tradition, there's no one single monolithic, everybody agrees on this this, um, proposition of what election, what predestination is. And and you'll even find that with Calvinists, you know, know, there's differences, but they generally agree on the the, um, main point, the main thesis, and it comes down to words such as Conditional or unconditional. So Wesley Arminians, they hold to conditional predestination, conditional election, where Calvinists hold to unconditional predestination, unconditional election. And you can have different ways of understanding how this or what this looks like and how this plays out in the scriptures and what the Bible teaches on this. So um, you know, again, there is going to be a diversity in in how we understand this doctrine. But it's always going to be under the same umbrella term as a Wesleyan Arminian 
we hold to conditional election, conditional predestination. So that's the viewpoint that I will be arguing for. I will say this, though, because this comes into the picture as well. People, when they talk about predestination and election, they tend to bifurcate the two between corporate election, corporate predestination, and individual election, individual predestination. So I think out of the two, if we have two options on the table, how do we approach election predestination? Is it corporate? Is it individual? To me, I answer this question, yes. <laughs> I answer this question, yes, meaning it is both corporate and it is both individual. And I think a lot of times in scriptures, you know, this is helpful to recognize that things aren't either or, but both and. So let me just repeat that. A lot of times in scripture, Things aren't either or, but both and. Both are true. And there's not one single motif a lot of times. And usually a lot of these doctrines that are wrong, they're not wrong because they hold to this, in in particular, this one motif. They're wrong because they hold to this motif at the exclusion of the other. They're saying it's only this one single motif, one single theme. And a lot of times, again, it's not that that, that that theme as it exists independently is wrong. It's just if that theme exists at the exclusion of the other, then it's wrong. So that's why when I see, when I come to the scriptures, I see both a corporate election and a individual election, the same with predestination. So it's both corporate and individual. There is a corporate body. There is a corporate rep- a representative. And this is also on an individual level. So we don't have to approach this either or, but both and. Election and predestination I believe from the scriptures is taught that it's both corporate. We are as a body corporately elected in the person Christ who represents us in him. As we'll, we'll draw that out from the scriptures. We are elected in Jesus Christ, which is corporate. And then within this corporate identity, there are individuals. There's me, there's you, there's this person, there's different body parts, but there's one body. So it's one body, but individual body parts, individual organs. So election is both corporate and individual. But let me talk about Wesley, how Wesley understood election. And this is really key and crucial, right? So how do, how do Wesley Arminians, Wesley Arminians who hold that anybody can be saved, that Jesus Christ came for all, he died for all, he calls all to be saved, and by God's grace, he gives his, his prevenient grace to all. Prevenient uh, is the doctrine that God restores and over, overcomes the effects of the fall from Adam so that man can, by God's grace and only by God's grace, repent and believe in the gospel. And they believe that God freely gives this not to select individuals, but to absolutely everybody. So everybody is in a position by by which they can be saved by God's grace. So how, do, how do then do we understand this in light of the Bible teaching that God has his people that he has chosen and predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ? Well, for Wesley Arminians, these two aren't at odds with one another, but they're they're consistent with one another. There's a consistency between salvation by faith with election and predestination. And I'll try to draw this out by Wesley's sermon, Free Grace. I talked about this sermon, I believe I talked about that in, in the latest episode, but one of the standard sermons of John Wesley, which I recommend you read this one, Free Grace. And there, John Wesley was responding to, to the Calvinism of his day, which is the same Calvinism pretty much of our day. I'm not going to get into that part, but in this sermon, which I, again, I recommend you read, John Wesley laid out at the end of criticizing Calvinism, showing how it's a horrible decree, how it makes God worse than the devil. I'm repeating his words, how it, it kills zeal for evangelism because if God has elected only certain individuals to be saved, there's nothing more that they can do or we can do in the gospel preaching has nothing has has no matter at all in salvation zero percent you know it has has any founding has any purpose in evangelizing telling others about christ after john wesley lays out the fallacies and the and the logical absurdities and how the scriptures clearly are against this and how calvinists make god worse than the devil again his words not mine john wesley at the end lays out what the true doctrine of predestination and election is because this is where this debate ultimately comes down to okay you know, and I think we know this, right? <laughs> when we have a conversation when when an Armenian and Calvinist go out, it, it always comes down to normally to election and predestination. So this is at the heart of it. So in this sermon at the end, John Wesley lays out the biblical doctrine of election and predestination. And I'll be reading 
from him, and I'm giving you the quote, and here it is. Yea, the decree is passed, and so it was before the foundation of the world. But what decree is this? Even this, I will set before the sons of men life and death, blessing and cursing, and the soul that chooses life shall live, as the soul that chooses death shall die. This decree, whereby whom God did foreknow, he did predestinate, was indeed from everlasting. This, whereby all who suffer Christ to make them alive, are elect, according to the foreknowledge of God, now standeth fast, even as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. So John Wesley is quoting from Deuteronomy 30, verse 9, when he says, Choose life, choose death. God, God told the Israelites, I set before you life and death, choose life. He's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 30. Um, John Wesley then is, is appealing to you know the truth of the scripture that God has presented to man, a choice, right? Life and death, faith in Jesus Christ or unbelief in Jesus Christ, repent or perish. We see this over and over again throughout the scriptures. So, so when we come to the doctrine of election and predestination, it's not at odds with this. There's no secret, mysterious plan that's that's making this void or inconsistent or um, destroying this truth that God has sent his son to all and for all. We don't have to worry about that. God then is choosing those who do repent and believe in Jesus Christ. And I want to read to you one more thing from John Wesley to help us understand how Wesley, how Wesleyanism, how Wesley Arminians understand the doctrine of predestination and election. Because again, as I'm using the word Wesleyan Arminian, I'm using that as a broader term to also encompass those who don't identify as a Wesleyan, but they say that they're an Arminian. Um, so that's a broad brush that we can use because we agree that election and predestination is consistent with salvation by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, by God's grace alone. So these two aren't at odds with one another. So John Wesley notes on 1 Corinthians 9.27, let me just read the verse that Paul says, and then I'll give John Wesley notes regarding this and how it plays into election and predestination. So the Apostle Paul says in verse 29, 1 Corinthians 9, if you want to turn there, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself shall become a castaway. Some translations say reprobate, the Greek word is adakimos, so either a castaway or a reprobate. But this is what John Wesley says regarding this. I'll read the last part that he says. And uh, here we go, quoting him. Res- Wesley writes, The single text may give us just a notion of the scriptural doctrine of election and reprobation and clearly shows us that particular persons are not in holy wit represented as elected absolutely and unconditionally to eternal life or predestinated absolutely and unconditionally to eternal death but that believers in general are elected to enjoy the Christian privileges on earth, which if they abuse those very elect persons will become reprobate, end quote. So hopefully you can see the idea here. Let me just paint the idea here. Paint paint with John Wesley how he sees election and predestination. So salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone. God sent his son to all, for all. God calls all men to repent and believe and promises that if they do, and for those who do so, they will have forgiveness of sins, be made righteous in Jesus Christ. So these then, when we get to the doctrine of election and predestination, this then is who God has chosen and whom he has predestinated. And on this note, let me just quickly define when we use words like election and predestination, so they are different from one another. Often they'll be used synonymously. Um, I get what you know why we do that. I I do that a lot because you know they're very closely identified with one another, but there are differences between the two. So election simply means uh, choosing who God chose, and predestination simply means a predestination. So think of the words, the first three letters of, uh, of the word predestination. P R E, right? So what does that mean? That means before. Then think about the next part of that compound word, destination. So that's where you're headed. That's that's where you're going. So God has pre beforehand determined people's destination, where they will go. So elect is who God has chose, 
and the predestination is for the ones that God has chosen where they will end up. That's election and predestination. If we can understand that properly, that uh, that will help us out. So we don't have to worry that you know often predestination is used as this term as this term as determinism, right? God has you know determined you that say you know from a week from now you're going to eat <laughs> cocoa puffs. And then after that, you're going to drink some water, um, go to the gym, take a nap for an hour. Like everything has been predetermined. Predestination is not determinism. Predestination is God choosing your end. And God in scripture has said that if you're a believer, this is your end. If you're an unbeliever, this is your end. So it's either heaven or hell. And how he has chosen that is by who is believing, who are trusting in Jesus Christ and who is not. This then for John Wesley, this, these these people, the believers, are the elect. These are the ones that God has predestinated. So predestination and election are conditional. This is what we mean by conditional predestination, conditional election. They are conditional. They're based upon faith in Jesus Christ. Therefore, the beauty of this is that they're not inconsistent with, with one another. You know, often you know we'll look at the two where we see in the scriptures, even Calvinists do, they see in the scriptures that Pre, uh, that I'm sorry, that salvation is conditional by faith alone in Jesus Christ, and they see also that God has called that God not only has called but is calling all men to believe in Jesus Christ. Where this is genuine call, genuine openness that if you repent and believe, you're saved. You can't go through the scriptures as a Christian and not see this. You have to be honest with this as well. So. We don't have to then pit this against, well, what do we do with election and predestination? Oh, it's a mystery. Oh, there's tension. We don't have to worry about that. Why? Because this, because God is clear. This is who I am saving. These are my people. These are my elect. These are the ones that I predestined. And I'm going to use the scriptures, and um, you know, I hope you'll follow along with me. We're going to use the scriptures to show how this is taught and how this is consistent and how it's not at odds with one another and that many people misunderstand election and predestination. So that being said, let's turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter 8. And if you're familiar, you know what verses I'm going to go to, verses 29 and 30. But actually, we're going to start in verse 28 to get some context because this is crucial. This is absolutely crucial. By the way, real quick, I do plan, maybe this will get you excited, I do plan on doing an episode, probably in two parts, because it's going to be long, on Romans chapter 9. I've been wanting to talk about that for some time, but I, but I was thinking as, I, as I'm planning out this episode, I'm thinking, you know what, I have to do Romans 9, because this does play into this as well, but I don't want to just do it in justice, I want to give it the proper interpretation exegetically on what Romans 9 teaches, without trying to bring in other scriptures, but just trying to simply exegete faithfully from that text alone, in its own context, what it is teaching. So I do plan on on doing that very soon. So by God's grace, I will do that very soon. So don't I don't think that we're just going to skip over that. But for now, we're going to go and focus on Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 30. And I'll be reading from the New King James. So verse 28, Paul writes to the Romans, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew... He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestinated, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. So, first things first. Predestination, as we mentioned, right? Predestination. God has pre-planned where you are going. Here we see in verse 29 that the predestination of God is to what? To be conformed to the image of Christ. That is where God has planned for believers to to end up. That's the goal. Hallelujah. Thank, Thank you, Jesus. To be conformed to the image of Christ. We're going to be like conformed. We're going to be morphed because that's a Another way to understand that word conformed, God, God is going to morph us into Jesus Christ, to the image of Jesus Christ. Thank you, God. But that's what predestination is. It's not to heaven or hell. It's specifically to the image of Jesus Christ. But I want you to see this from the text. And that's why I quote a verse 28. 
So verse 28, Paul doesn't just say that all things work together for good and stop there. I was watching the manifest with my wife and they quote uh, Romans 8, 28 often. And they quote only the part where it says all things work together for good. And I was joking with my, my wife when they did. I said, what does the rest say? Well, I would say to those who love God because <laughs> they weren't quoting it faithfully. They're taking it out of context because if you miss the next part, is Paul is specific that the things that that all things that work together for good are for a specific people. And who does he say that all things work together for good? To those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. So all things aren't working together for those who don't love God. All things are not working together for, for unbelievers and people who remain unbelievers. All things work together specifically to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. But those who love God, that is conditional. And those are the ones who are the called according to his purpose. So Paul says all things work together for those for good, to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. So it is this group of people that God has foreknew and predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. Now you could say, and a lot of people say this, or Calvinists say that foreknew is a verb, it's something that God does, which, amen, God foreknew you. And they say that it's intimately not, not, um, not in a foreknowledge sense where God is looking down the corridors of time, which why I'm on that note, no Arminian, no Wesley Arminian thinks that God is just looking through a tunnel and seeing, oh, here's what's going to happen. That's a mischaracterization. That's that's a straw man argument. No, no Wesley Arminian, no Wesley Arminian teaches that. And in fact, if you don't blame me, just look at John Wesley notes on First Peter one verse two, where Peter talks about foreknowledge. John Wesley talks about how that's to be understood in an anthropomorphic sense because all things are known to God presently. Peter is just using an anthropomorphic language to communicate what God knows or God's knowledge, which is ahead of time from our perspective. So no Wesley Arminian thinks that God is opening up the quarters of time and like, oh, look at this, that's going to happen. Oh, this is going to happen. Totally mischaracterization. So even if you argue foreknew means an intimate sense, yes, but who did God foreknew? Well, verse 28, that's why we have context. Those who love God. So for those who love God, these are the ones that God has foreknew and predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. These are the ones who are the called according to his purpose. These are the ones whom um, he will, he has justified and whom he justified. These are the ones whom he has glorified. It's not some random mystery. God told us, God has revealed to us who or what or who the all things together work for good. He has told us that it's for those who love him and those who are the called of him. And I want to compare this real quick with 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9. And I, and I recently saw this about a couple months back, and I, and I saw a, a cool connection between the two. So there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, Paul writes, But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for those who love him. So it's the same idea, right? Who has God prepared things for? Paul specifically writes in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, for those who love him. And think about that word prepared, right? It's, it's very similar to predestination. God has prepared something ahead of time. He's ready for this. He, he made plans for this. Paul says it's for those who love him. Just like he says in Romans 8, that all things work together for good the, to those who love him. And those are the ones that God has foreknew and predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. It's conditional. It's not unconditional. And in fact, why we're in 1 Corinthians 1, or 1 Corinthians, let's go to chapter 1 real quick in verse 21. And to me, this is actually one of the clearest verses, verses on predestination and election and for finding out who God has chosen, who God has elected, who God has predestinated. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through the wisdom did not know God, 
It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. So according to this verse, who, who is God pleased to save? Those who believe. And this is why Leroy Fourlines, who wasn't a Wesleyan, but he was a classical Arminian, one of the best Wesleyan scholars I have read, read his works. If you want solid classical Arminianism, exegetical defense of it, read his work. But this is why he says that the debate between Calvinism and Arminianism ultimately comes down to, is salvation conditional? Because the, you know, the Calvinists will say it is conditional, but they don't really believe that. Because if you have a doctrine that's called unconditional election, that means there is no condition for salvation. There is no condition. There's just a decree of salvation. You're going to believe. You're going to believe. You're going to be saved. You're not going to be saved. You're going to be damned. Where the Bible says God is pleased to save those who believe, and it is to and for those who love God. It's conditional. It is not unconditional. Next, let's go to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1. I'm sure you knew that ahead of time where I was going. So we go to Ephesians chapter 1. I'll start at verse 3 and I'll read through verse I'll read through verse uh, 5. So Paul says, "Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ." who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. You know what? I'll just read verse 6. Paul says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. So the first thing that I want that I would love for you to see in this verse is the phrase in verse four, two words, in him. And if you read Ephesians one, either pause and read it or read it afterwards. Go through the first chapter and see how many times Paul uses that, that preposition in, in him. So Paul in verse four is not saying God has chosen us to be in him as the Calvinists falsely want it read. It is not saying that the text reads that he chose us in him. So we were in him when God chose us, and in him is a condition, meaning those not in him are not who God has chosen. Those in him are who God has chosen. And then notice here that, we, that on top of election, election is chose, right? He chose, another word for elect is chose. He chose, he elected us in him conditionally because in him is a condition. We also have predestination. Verse 5, he predestined us to what? To, to salvation, to heaven? No to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ. And this is to the praise of the glory of his grace. A really cool thing I want to mention, and I learned this from Jacob Arminius. He talked about, when, when, when talking about the, this verse, he talked about, I believe he called it object relativity, if, if I'm saying that right. I might be mispronouncing that, that term. But what he taught was that Every act that has reference to an object, and this is going to be a little deep, but don't worry, because once you understand it, it, it's so cool. Every act that has reference to an object is posterior in nature. Okay, let me say that again so we understand that. Every act that has reference to an object is posterior in nature. So let's draw this out. So God has chosen man in Christ, which means man was first in Christ, in order that God has chosen him in Christ. Okay, so man man is already in Christ. Man is first in Christ, and then because they are, this is who God has chosen. So um, predestination is posterior to salvation by faith in Christ Jesus. So you're first believing in Christ, and then in Christ you are then elected. So the order here is in him predestination. predestination. 
predestination and election is coming posterior to man being in Jesus Christ. And again, that's simply what the text means. He's chosen us in him, not to be in him. And how do we get in him? By faith. Which, by the way, in this same chapter, you can actually prove this. Did you know that? Did you know that in Ephesians 1, you can prove that salvation is conditional and that we are in Christ by faith? So where does it say that? Well, let's start at verse 11 and then we'll read through verses 13. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 through, through uh, verses 13. Paul says, in him, there's that phrase again, in him, in whom? In Jesus. So those are whom God has chosen. Also, we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we, and listen to this, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So here we have clear indicators that salvation is by faith alone in Jesus Christ, and these are the ones that God has chosen and sealed. How ironic that the same passage that that, that people will distort to teach a horrible decree of unconditional election, that God has said that you'll be saved, you won't be saved, and that there's nothing you, you know, that, that there's nothing uh, more to be said or done, and that Jesus Christ coming and dying for them plays no part in this, that Jesus actually doesn't want them to be saved, even though he says and commands it. The same chapter teaches that, that God has, is saving and has chosen those by faith, and these are the ones that he has sealed. He says in verse 12 that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. And he says in verse 13, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So this happened after we heard the gospel and believed in Jesus Christ, which also, by the way, proves that regeneration comes after faith, not before faith, as the Calvinists will tell us. So that's all conditional. It's all in Ephesians chapter 1. He has chosen us in him, not to be in him, in him. And as we see, God has sealed us by the Holy Spirit after we heard the gospel and believed in it. There's one more verse, that one more section of scripture that I want to talk about. And I think that this is huge. All right, well, you know what? Actually, there's going to be one more I'm going to mention after this, but one, one big one, I guess. So go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, because we're going to read from verses 10 through 13. And this is game over for Calvinism. Election is conditional. So there Paul says, just to give you the context, he's talking about the end times when the Antichrist is going to show up and how there's going to be a deception. He says in verse 10, I'll read through verse 13. And with all unrighteousness, oh, I'm sorry, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Verse 13, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God had from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. So in verses 10 through 12, we see that unbelievers perish, not because God didn't choose them or Jesus didn't die for them, or God didn't elect them, and they just weren't the lucky uh, five-point Calvinists who are so humbled. No, they're going to hell because they rejected God's truth. Paul makes that clear. He spends three verses talking about it. Then in verse 13, he says he's giving thanks to God. Well, why is he doing that? He calls them beloved by the Lord. Because God has, from the beginning, chosen you for salvation through what? He doesn't stop there. Paul doesn't say God has chosen you for salvation. Stop. He doesn't say that. He has more to say about this. Through what, Paul? How did God choose you for salvation? Through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. So this verse actually, by the way, proves two things from, from the Wesleyan uh, systematic or, and, and even the Arminian systematic is that one, provenient grace through sanctification by the Spirit, 
God's grace, God's spirit works first in us so that we can work. It's prevenient. God first works and he works through salvation by faith in Jesus Christ and belief in the truth. So think about this, okay? Because I really want you to think about this. If if the Calvinists are telling you that election is unconditional, not even faith, yet Paul here says it's through sanctification and faith and belief in the truth, pistis is Greek word, then what does that mean? That means it's conditional. There's no way around this. It's just simply reading the text. We're not reading into the text. We're not interpreting from our own systematic. If we objectively look at it, this is what Paul says. You have to conclude that that salvation is conditional. Paul says it here. God's word says it here. Now, the next and final verse I just want to mention real quick. Yeah, you know, I believe we talked about this, but First Peter one two, because Calvinists will will try to um, knock Arminians for believing in foreknowledge and election. Well, that's a biblical term. That's a biblical term. And foreknowledge means knowledge ahead of time. It's made up of two words, fore and knowledge. What does foreknowledge mean? It's knowing facts ahead of time. You're having foresight. God has foreknowledge. Even if that's un- un- to be understood anthropomorphically, it still means exactly what it, what it says. It doesn't mean predestination. And so when we say God has elected us according to the foreknowledge, that's biblical talk. That's biblical talk. We can have confidence on God's word. First Peter says to the to the audience that he wrote to in verse two. I'm sorry, yep, in verse two of chapter one, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. According to what, Peter? The foreknowledge of God the Father. Don't let anybody ever knock you for believing that election is according to foreknowledge. That's what Peter says. That's what God's word says. And Calvinists will try to tell you that this means foreordained. It doesn't because that would result in redundancy in the text of scripture. For instance, in chapter two of the book of Acts, Paul says that God, that Jesus Christ was crucified and and delivered up according to the foreknowledge and predestined plan of God. Well, if foreknowledge and predestination mean the same thing, that means that Peter just, you know, uh, went into a redundancy Peter was then saying that Jesus Christ was was delivered up according to the predestined and predestined plan of God. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's absurd. The word is prognoskos. If I'm saying that right in the Greek, it's made up of two words again, for and knowledge. Gnosis is knowledge. You know, that's where we get the word prognosis from. It's getting knowledge ahead of time of what's wrong with you. God has prognosis. God has for knowledge. So to wrap this up, predestination is the biblical doctrine that God has predestined all those whom he has elected in Christ Jesus to be conformed to the image of his son, to be uh, predestined to the adoption of his sons. And it's after we heard the word of, of truth, the gospel of our salvation by faith alone, we see that it's consistent with salvation by faith. We don't have to pit these two against each other. They're not at odds. They are one and the same. Feel free to contact me for any questions in the comment. Please like, share that uh, the Helps Method Ministries out. Please hit the subscribe and notification button. Again, that helps Method Ministry out. Follow me on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook. We are growing on Instagram still. One of my goals is to pass up the United Methodist Instagram page. They have 70,000. My goal is to pass them up, not for pride's sake, but just to get away from the liberalism that has infected uh, many Methodist churches. It's 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 a sad reality. And I will be doing more episodes focused on what Wesleyan and, and how they understand certain key doctrines. I plan one on Romans 9. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you are too. And thank you again for tuning in and we'll be in touch when we uh, approach the Word of God once more, trying to find out the biblical method, which is what does God's Word teach us and what does God's Word want us to to live in application to his truth. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for predestination. Predestination, let me descend here, is a great, glorious doctrine to the praise and the glory of his grace. Thank you, Jesus Christ.